Good afternoon, John. Hi, Marty. Here we are, Friday, the 22nd of January. This is our first podcast of the Joe Biden era. Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. I wish I could say I felt a shift in the force, but I don't. Um, th there's been a, 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 I felt a shift. Um, there's, it almost like it was back to normal. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's like anything, uh, Trump is just no longer around. It's amazing to me. And, yeah, uh, that's, that's probably, that's probably delusional, but that's okay. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, <laughs> it's scary. It's like. So we'll see. Someday we'll uh, we'll talk about Scott Adams' two movies theory. But for okay. today, yeah. for today, um, as I said last week on the podcast, I've been starting. I've been reading this new book by Thomas Hubel called "Healing Collective Trauma: A Process for Integrating Our Intergenerational and Cultural Wounds." Yeah. And the first part of this book, he spends some. He puts some care into describing psycho psychological trauma. And he, he quotes uh, Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote that the body keeps the score, and others to whom we've referred, not only in this podcast, but also in our accountability work. Mm -hmm. um, as we continue to use our accountability practice to open up hidden impacts of childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were chatting before we started the podcast, uh, they continue to reveal themselves. And uh, there's there's lots more to there's lots more to go. And uh, I suggest that one of the reasons that there's lots more to go is because this trauma that we experience in our psyche is not simply ours alone. It's not uniquely mine. It's uh, mine, my family's my neighborhoods, my societies, and then ultimately my species. That trauma is a singular noun, not a plural noun. And therefore, um, what is true of me is true of all of us, is perhaps another way of saying that. Mm -hmm. So um, what I wanted to do, if just to set a foundation for discussing that today, is to read a quote from Gabor Mate, Gabor Mate, uh, you've, you've uh, referred to him a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, a, he's an MD who specializes in trauma healing, trauma therapy. And uh, so Hubel has a, an extensive quote here, but I thought we'd start here if this is something that, see what you, see what you think about this. Okay. He says, as Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And our biggest resource is our capacity to consciously examine ourselves. Trauma culture is designed to prevent us from examining ourselves, to keep us from that kind of consciousness. But that examination, such as we're engaged in right now, can only work because the answer is already within us. We are our biggest resource. Wow. Uh, that's, there's, that's, a, there's a lot like in that it. short paragraph, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, trauma culture keeping us from looking where we're effective, uh, keeping us um, occupied with everybody else's got a problem where they need to know this or they need to do that or I, I need to accumulate something to be better instead of looking the only place <laughs> that there's any relief. I don't know about answers, but um, relief to awareness, um, orientation to present moment, instead of being um, lost in some um, subconscious trauma that you don't even know you, you, you're not even able to stay in the in the present moment and then you throw upon uh, throw in the uh, trauma culture where um, we're trained 
propagandize, I don't know if that's the proper term, but to, to look outside of ourselves, to blame, blame the other side, um, polarize. Separate. Um, separate. You know, what just came to my mind is um, we, we usually, I think you mentioned it last time, had a common enemy and the common enemy has shifted towards two, shifted to each other. So we created camps and then we look at the other camp and say they're the enemy, um, which is part of what I believe to be the trauma culture. If I'm looking at you, judging you, I haven't got any time to, to look inside. Um, and actually what I know is that when I'm looking at you and have a judgment, that's about something internal with me. Um, uh, so, and an opportunity for me to, to look at something that's hidden, uh, subconscious, um, that's standing in my way of, of living authentically, living in the moment organically. <laughs> so. I think one of the challenges that we have, uh, I certainly have had it, um, and I've heard you refer to it, if I'm not mistaken, is this um, default position of right and wrong, of good and bad, of uh, appropriate, inappropriate. And not that things aren't right or wrong or good or bad in a relative context, but that there is a hidden standard. Belief system is the, one of the words that you, you use in, in your work. There's a hidden, I'm just going to use the word standard, there's a hidden standard against which these experiences of my life are judged as right or wrong or good and bad. And I'm unaware of that actual standard, or I'm unaware of the belief system that renders something right and something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's part of this trauma culture that Mate is referring to, that it's a, originally it was a safety mechanism set up by a little kid for whom there was good and bad. There was scary and safe. And since he didn't have any capacity to discern, analyze, ask for help, he was just stuck with whatever showed up and seemed to work. And then our brains and our emotional centers get organized around that defense as we then grow so that it just keeps getting tougher because now the evidence, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for evidence of lack of safety and how when we retreat back into our defense mechanism, we still feel safe, therefore, aha, this works. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's how what's good or bad begins to uh, gel in my unconscious, subconscious belief system. And then I've gone through years and years, decades and decades of applying the standard, which may have worked for little Marty, but not necessarily useful for, for adult Marty. Right. But that just shows up as a compulsive uh, need to say good or bad based on a little kid's assessment capabilities and not necessarily on a rational adult's capabilities. Well, um, yeah, and uh, the process of um, family of origin trauma is that we get identified with the behavior. Um, for an example, if I'm doing the right thing, I won't get punished. So doing the right thing means I'm loved. Um, and doing the right thing is, is um, arbitrary according to whoever whoever's judging what the right thing is it may be don't be quiet don't don't be talking and another time it mean how come you're not talking um and you got to figure that out and i i i'm gonna talk about me i identified with the behavior thinking it was me and that the the behavior had a an effect on the other people and i could make um angry or mad or happy um and i took that with me into my adulthood um one of the things i learned in my recovery is that i do have um i do impact the people around me <clears throat> i do not uh, make them feel anything or actually do anything 
the feeling and the doing is a choice on their part based on what their perception of me is. And, and I, I want to be clear that I, I, we all impact each other. We all have influence over each other. The choice I make um, when you do something is all mine. Um, and the same situation can happen. And I, I would find myself at different times making a different choice. Um, um, and that's when I realized that um, I choose my feeling. I choose my perception. I, I choose my re response or reaction. Now it's re reaction or, I mean, response before it was reaction. And then I blame you because you made me. If I have the power to make you, that absolutely means you have the power to make me. Um, and that's part of the cultural um, trauma language. I'd like to uh, read something else that Mate says that complicates what I think I just heard you say. And he says, um, it's impossible to separate personal trauma and collective trauma because the very physiology of our nervous system is created in interaction with the nervous system of other people from the moment that we're conceived. Even in utero, the emotional states of the mother have an impact on the developing nervous system of the child including all kinds of neurochemicals, chemical messengers, synapses, and connections. These states affect how brain systems will evolve and to what degree, and this will have a lifelong impact. So yeah. he goes on to uh, cite a study that was done in the aftermath of the Six Day War in Palestine, Israel and Palestine, 1967. He said it found that women who were pregnant then during the war were more likely to have had schizophrenic children as adults. What was happening collectively in the country was reflected in the individual neurobiology of infants in the womb. And we know this from multiple international studies. That's because our brains are really wired together. Since that happens on the neurobiological level, on the level of the nervous system and in the brain, and since the nervous system affects and is connected to every other organ in the body, it also happens on a biological level throughout the body, including in all the cells and all the organs and all the systems and so on. Therefore, it's not even possible to talk about trauma purely in individual terms. That's amazing. And, and I get that. The, the way I say it um, is um, we received our wounding in the presence of people necessarily we're going to do our healing in the presence of people um, and that aspect of our interconnectedness besides from Gabriel Monte talking about it it isn't um, um, common common talk common language Correct. common discussion um, it's more about um, um, pointing somebody out like a mass shooting they go right to mental health disorder um, and to separate us instead of um, talking about what's really going on. Um, it's well, again, I think, I think that if I were to, uh, which, I, which I'm doing in this book that I'm writing, if I were to be able to apply what we've learned about ourselves in accountability practice and uh, just seek to apply it on a mass basis, then I start to ask myself the question, what I've learned from you is, what do we want? And working backward from what we have should, in theory, lead me back to the, the collective wounding that's outworking in these kinds of ways. Now, I think it gets tricky because it's difficult. One has to keep an eye on one's own projections and doing, trying to undertake that. Because um, how we see what's going on around us will, there's not some kind of objective, in, objective agreement on how to describe that or how to, how to interpret that. So that's, that gets a little tricky. Um, and that's part of the power of accountability because it, it allows me to continue, 
allows me a, a process to continuously take a look at what I'm saying and feeling, ask myself if that's true. And if I feel out of alignment with my body, then I can go into the process. What am I feeling? What do I want? You know, um, go ahead. I'm going to say, but we're, we're, we're pioneering all this work um, with this process, this accountability process, which has this incredible power to it, as I've seen in myself and in other people time and time again. And the, the beauty of it, as we've discussed in other podcasts, is that it's always available, no matter what's going on with me. Because my body is always in sensation, in feeling. And if stressors arise, then my body's, the, the feeling level will elevate. And that brings attention, my attention to my body and reminding me to initiate the process of the accountability tree. Yeah, um, when, you, when we're talking about, uh, when I heard you say, what do we want? Um, mm -hmm. the, um, when I do that, when I ask myself, what do I want um, that, that I don't have? That's the question. I, I can pinpoint something for me that I don't have, like peace or um, calmness or um, self-love or... Um, now, uh, my question is, how do you do that with a group? And um, there has to be... That has to be. Um, I, I'm just going to offer that if it's with people who have done their own personal work, it, it may be doable. And um, um, right now, um, when that question is asked, what do we want? Um, there, that's what builds the camps. That's what builds the, the oppositional um, polarization. I want this, they don't. And it automatically goes to adversarial or pointing fingers. Right. Um, and I'm I'm like really open to continuing talking about this and then uh, seeing if uh, something develops that's um, practical, viable, um, uh, well well structured. There's a foundation for it, to where the end goal is um, also a we. Um, and then to do that, um, if you asked me to do that before my recovery, I wouldn't know what you were talking about. Um, or I would have created an idea of what it was based on my dysfunction or um, uh, perception at the time. So um, me doing my work and you doing your work, I believe is the foundation for the, for the we work. Well, I was gonna say there's good news and bad news. Um, so the good news is, that um, even two people comprise a we. Mm -hmm. And so the, the good news is that we can actually um, do what I think I heard you say and you implied that we, the two of us or I and another person or you and another person could create a conscious intention to be in relationship or in a conversation, let's say a dialogue whose objective is to feel into the we of, right. of the two of us. Okay, so this is what I want, this is what you want. Can we discern in that what we want? And I think it has to start there because anything beyond that becomes, as I was saying earlier, becomes subject to projection and um, subject to uh, triggering defense mechanisms and all those things. If they, If I haven't if I'm not 100% aware of how I'm triggered and how my defenses, my psychological defenses may um, feel called to arms mm -hmm. in, in a conversation, um, it might just seem normal for me to say, well, no, that's not what we want. And just and, and create, a, create a, some kind of violence to the we process without making that wrong. I use the word violence not it's bad. It's just, it's something that I might do 
to defend for a little kid to defend himself against what is perceived as a threat, even if there's none there. So I guess what I'm saying is that that perhaps uh, the only way to really um, experiment with this, and I, and I I haven't got far enough into to, to Hubel's book to find out what he says, um, but is to start in the we of two people and two people who have been doing this work so that that we have that common language and experience to draw upon. Yeah, as I was listening to you talk, um, one of the um, things you and I talk about is that when I do my work, it changes the collective consciousness. When I, when I do my introspection, I add something to the collective consciousness. And um, um, whatever might happen may, may just happen spontaneously. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm gonna say for me to, to like visualize that, which is what I'm, I'm gonna do, I'm, I'm gonna look towards it um, and have a feeling about it and everything else I've, I've become aware of in the moment I became aware of it, even though I had talked about it before, when I got there, whatever I was looking for um, was different than my experience of it. So, um, and this may very well happen with, with a collective um, um, shift or consciousness or doing it together or however that may look. I mentioned, I think it was last week, perhaps two weeks ago, about um, this form of dialogue that the uh, British quantum physicist David Bohm developed called Bohmian Dialogue, named after him. Um, and it is a process that seeks to create conscious access of the group consciousness. And one of the commitments that you make when you enter into a Bohmian Dialogue is to tell the truth about what you're feeling no matter what and to be willing to particularly tell the truth about things that your body or your uh energetic field may say i don't want to talk i don't want to tell the truth about this it's too scary it's too vulnerable mm -hmm. so what what bohm's insight was that any withholding of the genuine experience of individual members of a collective, a group, truncates the ability for the group to have a we experience, yep. which, which is exactly what, what Mate says in that quote that we, we read a bit, a bit earlier, mm -hmm. that trauma stops consciousness from happening. So yeah. in this case, if, if I'm sitting here and I've done this. I'm not. I'm not saying I've never done this. So sit here, um, and if you say something, and I think, and I don't like it, but I don't want to tell you I, that I don't like it because I'm afraid of creating abandonment, then I'm going to be sitting here with resentment or some other kind of um, traumatic re resultant experience, and then I've cut off. I've cut off the capability of being in communication with you. Yeah. Um, again, when you were talking, um, this thought came to me. Um, the great minds of our time were asked, what's the solution to global dilemmas? And, and their one word answer was dialogue. Um, so um, having the willingness to listen maybe what we're talking about having a, a group of people come together and that's the boom thing it reminded me of that too who um make an agreement and are willing to simply hear what the other person's saying not not to agree with or not to to kind of pick apart or criticize simply to hear it um and actually that's what happened with you and i when i asked you the question about um, um the republican side or the me coming from the liberal side. Um, and I was willing to listen. I was simply willing to listen. I was like trying to figure something out. Um, and it, um, it 
I, I didn't take on your ideology and it, it um, I can speak for myself, it softened my position and made it more inclusive. Um, so the, the um, in my dysfunction, my belief was that if I let somebody complete a thought, they would win and I would lose or, um, and I wasn't willing to listen all the way through. I'd listen to somebody talk and I'd have objections popping up all over the place. And if one was strong enough, I just simply blurted out, no, that's not right. Or uh, interrupt or think I know what you're gonna say and complete your sentences for you instead of simply listening. So that, that may well, be- it, it Well, might, it might even, be strengthened that willingness to listen might even be strengthened if I also say I'm willing to be wrong I'm willing to not win and those kinds of willingnesses because hidden behind the unwillingness to listen is a whole bunch of fears right that I might be served in being willing to face them yeah I'm willing to I'm willing to not be in relationship with you right all kinds of, uh, you know, that's the way we face our fears is by being being willing to let the worst happen. Yeah. To own, just own that as a possibility rather than continuously trying to push it away, even though it continues to live inside me as a feeling. Yeah. And that's tough to do. I mean, that's, that's, that's a completely different learned behavior from what I've learned to do for 60, almost 70 years now. Yeah, exactly. And that's what um, part of the, the my, um, what I offer to people is, is the willingness to fail, be wrong, right. and look foolish, um, and then simply to listen. And um, one of the programs I was in and taught was listen with an open heart and open mind. And um, it's it's life changing. It's uh, paradigm shifting. Um, and it, and it may be that simple. We just get a bunch of people together, all agree to listen, and everybody has their capacity to do that, and then work it out in the in the process. Maybe I that's... have I have several very close friends, um, with whom I noticed over the years of our relationship. Um, I had fundamental disagreements on certain things. And uh, and I noticed that whenever we, we tried to dialogue about them, it would just seem to blow up. And um, it occurred to me at some point, the ninth time I tried this battering ram approach to uh, to talking about tough things, and I'm not recommending this, I'm just, I want us to just talk out loud about this. Um, right. It occurred to me that my relationship with my friend was more important than being right. My relationship was with my friend was more important than even talking about this particular topic. And so what I decided to do is this, I'm not, I'm not going to raise this anymore unless the other person wants to talk about it. I'm just, I'm just going to pretend it's not there. Okay. And pretending not in the sense of repressing or dismissing but in the sense of it's just not important that my my relationship with my friend was more important to me than having to talk about this particular thing right yeah one of the things i heard growing up is you don't talk about religion or politics um and what we're doing is being willing to go into one of those realms or any any realm that's been taboo and simply hear the other person all the way through. What's, but, but what's interesting about the second friend that I'm I'm thinking of, it, it's never, it's never the topic that becomes touchy. It's that my friend has a tendency to not want to ever be wrong about whatever it is, and he'll start hammering me if if I if I say something with which he disagrees the slightest. And I used to like, well, no, 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 let me get the encyclopedia out or now, so let me go to the internet. It's like, and then I realized it's okay if he's right. I don't need to be right. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it wasn't religion, politics or whatever. It was more of a, uh, a, a psychological stance. Yeah. 
that it's like I don't need to argue with him about this. Right. It's like it's maybe it maybe it's another version of I'm willing to be wrong. Mm -hmm. In this case, I may I may actually be right, but I don't need to. I don't need to ma I don't need to state that. It's like okay, I'll let you be right. Yeah, um, I, I've gone through that process too, and um, I um, yeah, I'm not willing to pay the price of being right. Um, yeah, another way of putting it. Yeah, um, I was doing a, a workshop at the jail, and we set up this role play where the guy was standing in line it was uh, alternative to violence and um, somebody he went to, to a cell to get a towel and somebody came back and he was in his place <clears throat> and then we talked about what would you do and he said well i just go get my buddies and we'll start a, a riot here um and i asked him what what price are you willing to be right and he said whatever it takes and uh, it just struck me that, oh my God, in his situation, in his life, um, that was vital to him. He, that was something he had to do. Um, uh, and I, I'm not willing, I'm not willing to give up a friendship, be in a casual conversation, even with somebody I'm acquaintance with, um, I have, I don't need to be right. Um, which creates safety so the dialogue happens and I learn actually when I do think I'm right I'm, I'm there's probably something I can learn about you know because uh, nothing's written in stone everything's fluid and organic and gets added to and torn back down and added to again so there's no well the other right thing implies an answer the other thing that's going on then though is that we or I am prioritizing being in vulnerable openness to you over any specific item that we may be dialoguing about. Mm -hmm. That it's more important to me to stay in communion with you than the specifics of any given element of a dialogue. So open-heartedness, mm -hmm. it goes back to what you were saying earlier, open-heartedness becomes the value, not necessarily the specific exchange of ideas or concepts or whatever it looks like on the surface. Yeah. I'm talking with you because I want to be in communion with you, not because I want to exchange information. Yes. There you go. I can give an example um, uh, in a relationship I was with. Um, we were in a um, discussion about money and I, I made a decision to simply listen. And uh, my partner at the time started saying that um, what I heard was accusations that I'm, uh, I'm a magical thinker about money and I do this and I do that. And, sucking the money out of the relationship and on and on and on and in my mind uh, i'm like holy cow we're gonna get a divorce um and when she was done i i simply said i i want you to know that i hear you and um is there any more and then she oh heck yeah and um while she was talking for some reason i got that she was asking me if I loved her and, and it's like okay and she finished again and I said I, I just want you to know that I love you and I thought it was going to be signed the papers and she said John you're the greatest thing that ever happened to me I love you so much and we hugged and, and kissed and it's like how in the hell did that happen after that what I used to call a tirade um and um it was amazing it was simply amazing um one of the things another thing i talk about is that when i'm part when i'm being defensive i'm participating in my own oppression in other words if i find something that i need to defend um that's giving my power away um they're either right or they're wrong it's either okay or it's not um 
and um, I either am accountable or, okay, that's the way you see it. I get it. Well, you just made me, uh, you made me remember also that sometimes when um, the other person is uh, expressing or I'm expressing in um, childhood traumatic methods, over the top accusations, uh, you know, wild, violent language mm -hmm. or whatever. The truth of the matter for me almost always is somehow I'm feeling unloved and I'm, and this is the way I'm asking for it. Yeah. And it's like without being aware, because again, family of origin, communication style, you did this, you jerk, da da da, aka, I'm feeling unloved and don't know how to get it. Right. And now here I'm an adult, I'm a 69 year old adult, and I'm in a squabble with somebody when really what I want is to feel connected. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, what you, the example that you just shared sounds to me like that was at the very least what your partner was feeling if you weren't feeling that. And then yeah. when you had that aha moment and you shifted, you shifted the language to cohere with the actual underlying energetic truth. And so when you said that to her and she responded the way she did, because that may have been the real issue right. and the bank account may not have been the issue. Right. Yeah. I agree. But again, in our cultures, we're not trained to ask for love. And if, if you grew up in a situation like I did, and I think you, you might say the same about your own, it's like asking for love could be dangerous yeah asking it for just straight out yeah that's correct and that's when you might get the axe in the back right yeah in my family that was part of what the the frisson was that it could be anything it could be any response and i never knew from time to time whether it would be a benign or a violent response and so I just learned not to ask. Yeah. And then if I wanted something, I had to, I learned to manipulate. Uh, I learned to be hyper vigilant so I could stay several chess moves ahead and figure out what I needed to say to get what I wanted before the other person had any, like whether my dad or my mom had any idea I was doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Hyper vigilant. I was never able to translate that skill into playing chess well, but nonetheless. Uh, uh, well, I, I can tell you straight up, I don't play chess well. <laughs> Not at all. I don't know what happened. I'm messing with my screen here, you can probably tell. Anyway, I'm gonna go back to this one, okay. Um, so we started talking about group consciousness or race consciousness or um, the influence of um, culture, I guess it was culture, on our, our behavior and part of our training. And uh, I, I wanna offer also rewounding or um, yeah, rewounding of uh, childhood trauma. Um, that's in our culture, it's built into our culture, it's built into our judicial system. Punishment is the recourse instead of integrating, there's a um, um, restorative justice um, idea where the, the perpetrator and the victim are not, the perpetrator is not judged, they're, um, they're looked at as a value and how do we restore them to the community. And also the victim is, is uh, disenfranchised or seen differently also. And how do we restore both of them back into the community instead of separating one out, punishing behavior? Um, not that there's not consequences for behavior. That's not, that's not the idea. And the idea is to bring everybody back into community. 
restorative justice. So um, that's a that's a concept that goes against the the race consciousness and the um, culture that we live in. So how does that work? Uh, a group of people from whatever community or were involved in these two people's lives, the perpetrator and the victim, come together with a um, with the purpose of determining consequences for the offense that's um, in alignment with the, the offense, with the idea of restoring the perpetrator back into the community, and um, also taking into consideration the um, fractured energy or plight or situation of the victim, and then how to restore that person back into well, my interpretation would be feeling safe in the community. Um, uh, and the community is more interested in its members than, um, than isolation. I don't know if I said that right, but more interested in the viability of the community and everybody has value. Um, it's not about exclusion. Um, our judicial system, correction system, and law enforcement is about exclusion, about putting, separating. Uh, and if it worked, then, uh, well, okay, cool. And it's not working. Um, so. You, as you were sharing that, I was thinking of um, how that works in a, in like a group process, like in an accountability practice group or ACA or 12-step meeting where um, people have been known to act out, violate the traditions, or do other things that um, made people uncomfortable or, or were, you know, egregious misbehaviors by the norms of the community or the, the group and um, how the the traditions and the 12 step say that I think the first tradition is our group unity is the most important thing to our recovery. Yeah, there's there's built in um, um, avenues for addressing uh, violations of um, either um, confidentiality or safety in the group, somebody commenting on what somebody else said, um, somebody um, inappropriately um, approaching somebody else and that person feeling uncomfortable, um, they have um, resources or uh, places to go to rectify that with the idea everybody's value is not we want to exclude this person. Um, they're in their old behavior they don't know. Maybe uh, they're new uh, and to offer information about how to keep the group together and viable. Yeah, so it's, a, it's nice to know that um, human beings, even with our woundings, are also looking for these um, healing modalities on not just an individual level, but on a collective level. Yeah, and um, the, um, the agreement, as far as I understand them in the 12-step process is this is a safe place and you're seen as valuable, newcomer is seen as valuable to the, to the continuation of the process and to the old timer, um, the newcomer is valuable. So there's safeguards for um, keeping that. Well, and, and the, um, almost to bring our conversation full circle, the safeguards include a commitment to dialogue. Actually, it's, it's in there, listen, to uh, simply listen, no comment, no, um, no advice, just simply to hear it and um, our rumbling where, where it's like, thank you for your share, no matter, no matter what the share was, it's right. thank you. Thank you for offering that and thank you for the share. Um, I hear you. Um, when I do a retreat um, and uh, one person's talking, we have this uh, process where we use the um, talking stick, we're drumming, and somebody holds the stick 
everybody else listens. Nobody comments, nobody says anything. And when the person's done, there's this, we, we say um, a Native American word, which is aho, which means I heard you, I see you. And that's the comment. There's no clapping, there's no um, other comments than I heard you, aho. Um, and uh, the person sits down, we continue the drumming until somebody else feels moved to, to dialogue. It's a very powerful exercise. Um, everybody that's gone through it, for the most part, that have said something to me, have, have said it was very profound. Um, and they found themselves saying things that they had no intention when they first started of either revealing about themselves or talking um, in a way that's um, vulnerable. So, yeah. One of the uh, essential elements of the work is, again, a word that you used earlier today, um, a, a open heartedness. And openness, of course, is the characteristic of communion with each other as opposed to the experience that we had growing up in these dysfunctional families of ours where the opposite was the value. Stay safe, stay apart, don't be open-hearted, stay closed-hearted and you'll keep your head down and you'll, you'll be, you should be able to get through this okay. And so, and I would, I would suggest that open-heartedness is actually our fundamental nature and that the anything that has the impact of of turning me inward is also turning me against my fundamental nature and that's again we could call that another way another way to describe trauma yeah um open heart and open mind is uh, for somebody who has experienced trauma is a um not an option right not an exactly option and to be guarded, to be hypersensitive about what you're hearing, to tear apart what you're hearing, to make sure it's, it's like you're hearing it right and you're not going to get in any, any trouble. That's I'm, Or I'm going to get in any trouble. That's my thing. One of the things that I, I've, I've learned from you that's of value in this uh, process of learning to listen is that wonderful question, what did you hear me say? And... Uh, I haven't learned to use that as frequently as I would like to. So I'm gonna set an intention to ask people what they heard me say, particularly if I'm communicating something that's emotionally challenging. Yeah, or For or, me or the other person. Or, yeah, or instructive in a, in a new uh, uh, frame of reference. It's like you hold value as a human being. I want you to know that that's where we're going to start. You hold that as a human being. And then, you know, um, what, wh how are you hearing that? What do you, what's the feeling you have when you hear that? Or what did you hear me say? Um, or after I explain a, a process or the accountability process or uh, where the information come from, came, came from um, how trauma creates a, a pool of information that is um, guarding me against that trauma happening again, uh, what did you hear me say? Everybody creates an idea of what I'm saying and none, none of them are according to the picture I have of what I'm saying, can't be. I just know they're just, they don't have my experience to have this picture. So, um, and then opening that, that question opens it up to me being available to your experience. Um, and I find myself often learning something about what I said. <laughs> And how I said it, and how it impacts people, and where people go with it. So, yeah, that's something that uh, we all could incorporate to great effect in uh, many more many more situations that we find ourselves in. So, so I intend to uh, I intend to take advantage of that. Sounds good. What did you hear me say? What did you hear me say? You and I could probably do that for half half of this talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, um, we've been doing this long enough. Um, I know you're open to hearing what I heard you say or hearing where I went. <laughs> <laughs>
when you were talking. Right. Um, and it's like a, uh, not a feeding off, but a, a growth off of um, a building of a concept um, based on our both of our experiences. A word that jumped into my mind was collaboration. The, yeah. Like that might be the opposite of collusion. Ah, maybe. Collaboration. Um, collaboration. Because it's being done with conscious intent. Collusion is done without conscious intent. Yeah. One of, one of the things that were in place for me yeah, um, as far as group consciousness or my my ability to hold space for people to dialogue and, and feel safe is that I have come to realize the truth for me that you, you are valuable to me. There's a, there's whatever you say, if, if you don't say it, I will never know because there's no way I could know what, how you put together. And when we share that, I, I always grow. So, um, and I also know that um, your safety is directly tied to my safety. That if you feel safe, I'm safe. Um, uh, and that we're all part of um, a whole, a viable part, an important part um, of what we're creating together and, and where we're going. So I have this saying, I may have said it before, um, everybody goes. If one person doesn't go, nobody goes. Everybody goes. So that puts me in a different mindset in my ability to listen or offer or create safety or hold space, whatever I'm, I'm intending to do. So. From a, a big picture perspective, we're always driving toward the higher consciousness. And ultimately, we're driving past consciousness of ourselves as individuals. And we are driving toward a consciousness of ourselves as human or as humanity. Whether we know it or not. Exactly. Uh, and I'm, I'm for, the, for the camp of knowing it and then um, um, participating at that level, knowing that um, we're all growing together. Um, and, and we're going to get there. Um, um, I don't know the big picture. And I'm willing to do what I do to um, make that process easier. Exactly. And that's what, that's what we can do. Yeah. That's what we can do. So I, I appreciate this time to discuss the value of dialogue and the, the we space, the space that's between us um, that we are part of, but mostly unconsciously that uh, we can still experiment with learning to understand the we, um, the, there, there's in the Christian um, mythology, there's uh, Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. And I hear that as this principle that when we communicate in an open-hearted dialogue, we're create the, the, the we, starts to manifest itself and for us it's mostly still unwordable i don't i'm still not at the point where i can say ah this is it on the other hand i've had experiences with you and others uh also in a group process where there's we can feel that something's shifted among all of us even if we can't name it right. uh, or you may have a name for it that's different from mine, but it's still there. It's still palpable. So before we ring off, I want to uh, uh, ask you if we want to share about your uh, upcoming workshop on the 31st of January. Um, it's uh, the 30th. Is it open? Of January. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's a Saturday, the 30th of January. Um, and. Um, if, if somebody's interested, they can either call you or contact you or contact me. And I'll give them the information. So, Actually, I'm going to see if I can get our, our technical guy to uh, post it to the end of this webcast. So okay. 
John's doing a workshop for adult children of alcoholics, West Great Lakes region, or whatever, yeah. they, whatever they're called. And it's, uh, it's at noon central time, and which is 10 o'clock here on the East Coast, or I'm sorry, on the West Coast, or one o'clock on the East Coast. Uh, it's an hour and a half of presentation and an hour and a half of dialogue and Q&A, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. And it will be uh, accessible on Zoom. So you'll want to get the Zoom address. If for some reason we couldn't append that information to this uh, podcast, please contact me or John, and we'll be happy to share it with you. Uh, our contact information is always at the end of the podcast. If you'd like to participate in one of our groups, uh, we've got a new men's group that just started, uh, a men's accountability group on Tuesday nights at six o'clock uh, Pacific time. Um, so just contact me uh, to be plugged into that. It's also conducted on uh, the Zoom platform. Or if you'd like to talk to John about any items, uh, working with him directly or some of the work, that, uh, some of the group work that he does, contact John. His information is also at the end of this podcast. Okay, Marty. Any last words for the good of the order, John? Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. There's a, about uh, people and coming together. There's an Irish thing, and I'm not sure if the author was in Donahue or he thought it was part of the Irish lore. And it, it simply states, um, the space between us is sacred ground. I'd say amen. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you next time. You got it. Take care. Have a great weekend. You too.